say under d block elements let us discuss now magnetic properties. Magnetic properties. Most of the d block elements exhibit paramagnetic property. Most of the d block elements and their compounds exhibit paramagnetic property. Why they exhibit paramagnetic property? It is due to presence of unpaid electrons in d orbitals. It is due to presence of unpaid electrons in d orbital. You take any transition metal or d block metal and their compounds, at least they are carrying single unpaid electron. Therefore, most of the d block elements and their compounds exhibiting paramagnetic property. If you consider a d0 electronic configuration or a d10 electronic configuration, d0 electronic configuration or d10 electronic configuration, they are not carrying any unpaired electron. Therefore, they are found to be diamagnetic. They are found to be diamagnetic in nature. We come across different types of magnetic properties, different types of magnetic properties. The first property we can say paramagnetic property, paramagnetic substance let me say, paramagnetic substance, second one diamagnetic substance, diamagnetic substance and third one let me say ferromagnetic substance, ferro, ferromagnetic substance and uh, next one antiferromagnetic substance, antiferromagnetic magnetic substance, anti-ferromagnetic substance. So, paramagnetic substance, diamagnetic substance, ferromagnetic substance, anti-ferromagnetic substance and uh, one more substance we come across, ferrimagnetic substance, ferrimagnetic substance. Like this, different magnetic substance are there. You know well, this particular paramagnetic substance, paramagnetic substance. The substance which is attracted by the magnet. The substance which is attracted by the magnet, we call it as what a paramagnetic substance. A paramagnetic substance generally carrying unpaid electron, generally carrying unpaid electron. Whichever the substance carrying unpaid electron that is attracted by the magnet, such a substance we call it as what a paramagnetic substance. Coming to diamagnetic substance, the substance which is generally repelled by the magnet. The substance which is generally repelled by the magnet, we call it as diamagnetic substance, diamagnetic substance. Diamagnetic substance generally carrying paid arrangement of electrons, paid arrangement of electrons. Therefore, that particular substance is repelled by the magnet, so the substance we call it what? Diamagnetic substance. Why? A paramagnetic substance is attracted. You see, if you are taking one unpaid electron in there, Generally, a unpaired electron always tries to make its spin 0, its spin 0. Therefore, a unpaired electron carrying what plus of spin or minus of spin. To make its spin 0, it is moving toward the magnet to make the, the north pole and south pole of this particular magnet. One will be plus of, the other one will be minus of. Therefore, the plus of electron which is carrying plus of electron that is moving toward the magnet to make its spin 0. Therefore, this particular paramagnetic substance is attracted toward the magnet. Next coming to diamagnetic substance. Why a diamagnetic substance is repelled by the magnet? See, when spin is 0, then it should not show any response. Generally, according to the number of unpaired electrons and uh, the paid arrangement of electrons is there. According to number of electrons and pairing of electrons, we cannot say it is uh, diamagnetic. Now, a diamagnetic substance, whenever a diamagnetic substance is put in the magnetic field, there will be some induced, there will be some induced, induced paramagnetic moments are developed. These paramagnetic moments are working in opposite direction to the field of the magnet, to the field of the magnet. Therefore, a diamagnetic substance is repelled by the magnet. What I am saying, when a diamagnetic substance is put in the magnetic field, magnetic field, there will be some induced temporary paramagnetic moments are generated. These paramagnetic moments working in opposite direction to the field of the magnet. Therefore, that particular substance is repelled by the magnet. Next, the effect of diamagnetic moment is less than paramagnetic moment. See, 
paramagnetic moment is a permanent one it is there in the substance but diamagnetic moment what i said it is induced by the field of the magnet therefore it is induced temporary and small because of this particular reason since it is a induced magnetic moment the diamagnetic effect is less than paramagnetic effect diamagnetic effect is less than paramagnetic effect because diamagnetic effect is a induced effect but paramagnetic effect is permanent one it is there in the substance next coming to ferromagnetic substance ferromagnetic substance the substance which is exhibiting greater paramagnetic moment than expected from the number of unpaired electron from the number of unpaired electron once you consider a substance you take which is carrying three unpaired electron this particular substance is carrying three unpaired electron once it is carrying three unpaired electrons you can expect a theoretically a magnetic moment of 3.8 for example i am giving 3.8 bore magnetons of magnetic moment it is exhibiting but experimentally proved to be this particular substance is exhibiting greater than the expected now it is exhibiting 4.3 bore magnetons of magnetic moments imagine so the substance which is exhibiting greater paramagnetic moment than expected from the number of unpaired electron such a substance we call it what ferromagnetic substance why a ferromagnetic why a ferromagnetic substance is exhibiting greater paramagnetic moment because in a ferromagnetic substance the paramagnetic centers are very near to each other the paramagnetic centers are very near to each other once paramagnetic centers are very near to each other alignment of their magnetic fields are possible alignment of their magnetic fields are possible means their uh, magnetic fields are aligning together working in the same direction working in the same direction of the field of the magnet therefore that particular substance all together working in the same direction therefore that particular substance is exhibiting greater paramagnetic moment than expected such a substance we call it what ferromagnetic substance what are the examples under ferromagnetic substances now we can take most of the iron most of the iron cobalt nickel most of the iron cobalt nickel and their compounds are generally exhibiting ferromagnetic property ferromagnetic property in this ferromagnetic substances the the paramagnetic vectors or the magnetic vectors are in this way they are working so all are working in the same direction in the field of the magnet so the paramagnetic vectors of a ferromagnetic substance working this way we can how to show this particular ferromagnetic substance the vectors of paramagnetic lines are working in the same direction coming to anti ferromagnetic substance the substance which is exhibiting lesser paramagnetic moment than expected from the number of unpaired electron look here it is carrying four unpaired electrons once four unpaired electrons are there it has to exhibit a paramagnetic moment of what uh, we can expect 4.8 4.8 uh, bore magnetons of magnetic moment but uh, it is not exhibiting 4.8 it is only exhibiting 3.9 imagine then such a substance we call it what uh, anti ferromagnetic substance the substance which is exhibiting lesser paramagnetic moment than expected such a substance we call it what uh, anti ferromagnetic substance anti ferromagnetic substance why a substance is actually acting as anti ferro substance whenever paramagnetic centers are away from each other once paramagnetic centers are away from each other alignment in the same direction is not easy therefore they may act opposite to the field of the magnet so some of the paramagnetic moments of this particular substance acting opposite to the field of the magnet therefore that particular substance is exhibiting anti ferro property so in anti ferro property the paramagnetic centers are away from each other in a ferro substance the paramagnetic centers are near to each other when they are near aligning in the same direction when they are away from each other alignment is not possible therefore this particular substance is actually exhibiting anti ferro substance anti ferro substance exhibiting anti ferro property next uh, ferri magnetic substance ferri magnetic substance in some of the substances 
in some of the substances the magnetic vectors the lines of magnetic vectors which are working in the direction of the field of the magnet and which are working opposite to the field of the magnet once they are not equal once they are not equal then that particular substance exhibiting slight paramagnetic moment such a substance we call it what ferri magnetic substance ferri magnetic substance in ferri magnetic substance the magnetic moment vectors some i am writing like this some i am writing opposite to each other some are like this and some are opposite to each other these are two are actually opposite to each other these two are actually working in the same direction such a substance what to call ferri magnetic substance so ferro magnetic substance exhibiting greater paramagnetic moment than expected anti ferro exhibiting lesser paramagnetic moment than expected ferri magnetic substance exhibiting slight uh, paramagnetic moment such a substance what to call ferri magnetic substance like this ferro magnetic anti ferro magnetic substance and uh, ferri magnetic substance like this different types of magnetic substances are there next we discuss what is curie temperature and uh, nil temperature we know now what are what are what are paramagnetic substances paramagnetic diamagnetic ferri magnetic and uh, anti ferri magnetic substances in addition that ferri magnetic sub anti ferro and again ferri magnetic substance let us see now total paramagnetic moment of any substance total paramagnetic moment of any substance total paramagnetic property total paramagnetic property of any substance equal to spin angular moment plus orbital angular moment spin angular moment plus uh, orbital angular moment spin angular moment plus orbital angular moment total paramagnetic property of any substance dependent on two factors one is spin angular moment and orbital angular moment what is this spin angular moment and orbital angular moment consider an electron is actually revolving around the nucleus electron revolving around the nucleus you consider when it's revolving this particular electron is actually spinning on its own axis spinning on its own axis developing a particular magnetic moment what to call spin angular moment while revolving itself it is actually spinning on its own axis and again revolving around the nucleus once it is revolving around the nucleus in a particular orbit again it developing one more magnetic moment while revolving in the orbit developing particular magnetic moment what you call orbital angular moment one is spinning on its own axis developing a particular magnetic moment spin angular moment next uh, revolving around the nucleus in a particular orbit one more magnetic moment it develop that is only what orbital angular moment these two moments together only we call total paramagnetic moment of that particular substance total paramagnetic moment of that particular substance therefore spin angular moment plus orbital angular moment this we can also show by a equation nu s plus l here s stands for spin angular moment and l stands for orbital angular moment the equation for this nu s plus l is equal to under root of 4s into s plus 1 plus l into l plus 1 l into l plus 1 this stands for orbital angular moment this stands for this stands for spin angular moment this stands for spin angular moment this stands for orbital angular moment now in d block elements especially in 3d series in d block elements especially in 3d series this orbital angular moment is completely quenched by the ligand fields completely quenched completely quenched by the ligand fields in other way quenching means cancelled by the ligand fields why in d block elements what i am saying especially in 3d series the orbital angular moment is completely quenched by the ligand fields because the d orbitals are there in the penultimate shell near to the ligand fields what do you understand by this look the board now let us talk about 3d series 3d series means fourth period let me write four shells 1 2 3 4 then electronic configuration let I, let me say it is 4s2 for 3d series it is actually 3d now this particular ligand is here ligand it is 
ligand is a very near to the d orbital. Therefore, the field strength of this particular ligand is affecting the orbital angular moment of electron in the d orbitals. So, in d block elements, especially in 3D series, the orbital angular moment is completely quenched or cancelled by the ligand fields because the ligands are there in the, the d orbitals are there in the penultimate shell that is it is near to the ligand fields. Therefore, ligand field is affecting the orbital angular moment of electrons in d orbital. Therefore, half of the equation is sufficient to calculate the total paramagnetic moment especially in 3D series. Therefore, we can write now mu f2 mu f2 is equal to only half of the equation I am taking here that is under root of 4s into s plus 1 under root of 4s into s plus 1 is enough. The same equation generally you also know you use one more equation in addition to that mu f2 is also equal to under root of n into n plus 2 n into n plus 2 one more equation you use under root of n into n plus 2 one more equation is also there to calculate this particular only spin angular moment g into under root of g into under root of s into s plus 1 s into s plus 1 also you can use here g stands for gyro magnetic ratio gyro magnetic ratio its value is 2 so by using either of the equations we can calculate the total paramagnetic moment whether you are using the first equation or the second equation or third equation all are one and same or for all applying all the three equation you will be getting only one value. Suppose one electron is there unpaid electron then use the first equation or the second equation third equation you will be getting only 1.7 bm 1.7 bm. So, either of the equations are having same meaning and same value they are giving only wherever you are applying yes wherever you write yes consider as the spin wherever you are writing n consider as the number of unpaid n stands for number of unpaid electron S stands for spin of the electron. Accordingly, you can calculate the magnetic moment of any given number of unpaired electron. Now, once we know the number of unpaired electrons in any metal or any substance, we can easily say its magnetic moment. Its magnetic moment. I will write a small table try to understand this. What I am writing, look the board. Number of unpaid electrons. Number of unpaid electrons and uh, magnetic moment magnetic moment magnetic moment in bms magnetic moment in bms magnetic moment in bms now one unpaired electron two three four five this is what number of unpaired electrons imagine then magnetic moment comes to be magnetic moment comes to be if one electron is there you can take 1.72 2 bm you can take 1.72 2 bm if 2 unpaired electrons are there you can take 2.8 through 8 to 3 you can consider 2.8 to 3 and 3 unpaired electrons are there you can take 3.83 to 4 4 magnetons you can take once you are taking 4 4.87 4.87 to 5 you can take if 5 is there 5.92 6 you can take like this roughly you can say the magnetic moment. What you can understand by this particular table? If one unpaired electron is there, 1.8 you take roughly, 1.8, 2, 2.8, 3, 3.8, 4, 4.8, 5, 5.8, like that you can take the magnetic moment. In any substance, if unpaired electrons are known, we can say it is magnetic moment that 1, 1.8, 2, 2.8, 3, 3.8, 4, 4.8, 5, 5.8, like that you can say the magnetic moment of any substance wants to know the number of unpaid electrons. Next, these magnetic moments are generally measured in Bohr magnetons. What to say? Bohr magnetons, BMs. See, 1 BM equal to E H by 4 pi M C. 1 BM is equal to E H by 4 pi M C. Once a question appeared, define BM. You need not write any definition for this, simply you can write 1 bm is equal to E h by 4 pi m c. E stands for electronic charge, h stands for Planck's constant, m stands for mass of the electron and c stands for 
velocity of light. If you substitute all these values, that will give the value for 1 bm. So, the magnetic moments measured in Bohr magnetons, 1 bm is equal to E h by 4 pi m c, E h by 4 pi m c. Generally, magnetic moments, magnetic moments are measured by using a balance. Magnetic moments are generally measured by using a balance. Balance, what do you call this particular boil balance? This particular balance is Guy balance, you see. Guy balance. The magnetic moments are generally measured by using Guy balance. Guy balance is actually exponential setup is like this for the Guy balance. This is what two magnetic poles will be there. Two magnetic poles will be there, one in north pole, the south pole. In between these two, a small a small glass tube is actually actually hanging. This is actually connected to a digital weighing machine, digital weighing machine. Suppose you have taken a certain substance in this, certain substance in this. This particular substance, you do not know what is the nature of this particular substance. It may be a paramagnetic or it may be a diamagnetic, but you do not know what is the nature of the substance. Then consider 1 milligram of the substance you have taken. What you have taken? 1 milligram. Now, once it is paramagnetic, once you put on the instrument, then its weight is increasing. Say why it is increasing? It is attracted by the magnetic field. Therefore, its weight is increased. After putting on the instrument, once its uh, weight is increased by 1.5 milligrams, you say, then you can say that it is attracted. Therefore, you can consider that particular substance is what paramagnetic. Once its weight is decreasing, suppose this 1 milligram has become 0.5 milligram, then what you can see? It is repelled by the magnetic field. Therefore, any unknown substance, once you are putting the magnetic balance due to magnetic field, it may be its weight is increasing or decreasing. Once its weight is increasing, say it is paramagnetic substance. Once its weight is decreasing, say it is what a diamagnetic substance. Accordingly, increase or decrease in weight, the unknown substance you can say paramagnetic or diamagnetic. Increase in the weight, you can easily calculate. Based on the increase in the weight, you can calculate number of unpaid electrons in that particular substance. This is the way we do calculate the magnetic moment. Based on the magnetic moment, we can say what, what number of unpaid electrons are there in a given particular substance. This is about uh, magnetic balance and uh, how we calculate the magnetic moment of a given substance. How a question appear on this particular magnetic properties. In a compound of cobalt, in a compound of cobalt, the magnetic moment is, compound of cobalt, the magnetic moment is 6 bm. 6 bm. What will be what will be the oxidation state of cobalt? Oxidation state of cobalt. In a compound of cobalt, the magnetic moment is 6 bm. What will be the oxidation state of cobalt? Now, A is given as what a plus 2 tick and uh, B plus 3, C plus 4, D none, D none. Such a question appeared in the examination, 6 bm is given. 6 bm means what I have given, if it is carrying 5 unpaired electrons, its magnetic moment is 5.9 to 6 I said. You have to check it, in which oxidation number cobalt is carrying 5 unpaired electrons, 5 unpaired electrons. Yesterday I explained, now you can take uh, this particular cobalt 27. 27 D 7 S 2 D 7 S 2. Now, you consider plus 2 oxidation state, plus 2 means it is what D 7. D 7, how many unpaired electrons in the D 7? Only 3 unpaired electrons, it is not our answer. Next coming to 3, in plus 3 oxidation state, plus 3 oxygen state, 2 electrons from V S, 2 ele 1 electron from D, then it is D 6 configuration, D 6 means what? 4 unpaired electron it is also not our answer, we require 5 unpaired electron. Then consider plus 4 oxidation state, then it will become what D 5, D 5 then 5 unpaired electron answer is what uh, plus 4. So, questions are appearing like this, 
So they will give the magnetic moment. They will put a question. What is the oxidation number? What is the oxidation number? Then how to check it? According to the given magnetic moment, first you have to check number of unpaired electrons. Accordingly, which oxidation number is correct answer? According to this particular question, the answer is what? Plus four. In plus four, it is carrying d5 configuration, five unpaired electron. Then magnetic moment is 5.926. So answer is what? A C. Next, magnetic properties were completed. Next, uh, let us see color properties of d block elements. Color properties. color properties. See most of the d block elements, most of the d block elements, d block elements and their compounds. Most of the d block elements and their compounds exhibit color, exhibit color. It is due to presence of unpaired electrons in d orbital. It is due to presence of unpaired electrons in d orbitals or incompletely filled d orbital. Presence of unpaired electrons in d orbitals or incompletely filled d orbital. Second reason you can say it is due to d to d electronic transitions. d to d electronic transition. What is this d to d electronic transition? This particular transition you can also say according to crystal will theory t to g to e g electronic transition. This you can also write as what uh, t to g to e g electronic transitions T to G 2 easy electronic transitions you can see. What is this? According to crystal field theory you might be knowing this 5 d orbitals, 5 d orbitals under the influence of any ligand, under the influence of any ligand consider a C n minus a aqua ligand, a amine ligand you can take any ligand. Under the influence of this particular ligand the 5 d orbitals splitting into different energy levels. The 5 d orbitals splitting into different uh, energy levels. Higher energy level we consider what E z and lower energy level we consider what uh, T 2 z. This is what uh, T 2 z and E z. Now you consider a d 3 electronic configuration. After the splitting the electrons are entering into lower energy levels. After splitting the electrons are entering into lower energy level. Next, the energy difference between these two energy levels is very less that what you represent delta O. Delta stands for energy difference, O stands for octahedral geometry. The splitting of orbitals in octahedral geometry is like this T to Z and E Z. Now, the energy difference between these two energy levels is very less, it is more or less equal to visible region of light. Now, color from this particular visible region of light is absorbed. Imagine x color is absorbed. Then electron from lower energy level is excited to higher energy level. Electron from lower energy level is excited to higher energy level. You know well this electron in the higher energy level is less stable. Once it is entered to the higher energy level again it comes back to the same lower energy level. While de excitation absorbed energy is actually transmitted whatever the color it is transmitting that will be the color of the compound that will be the color of the compound. What is this dt transition? Yes, both are d orbitals only. Lower energy level is d orbital, higher energy level is d orbital. This particular we are calling it as what d to d electronic transition or t to d to e g electronic transition. This is the reason for the most of the d block elements and their compounds exhibiting color exhibiting color. Next, the color property is dependent on various factors. What are the factors influencing the color properties of d block elements? The factors influencing the color properties of d block elements. Let us see that. The color properties are influenced by the color properties are influenced by Color properties are influenced by the first one, number of unpaid electrons, number of unpaid electrons, number of unpaid electrons in d orbitals, number of unpaid electrons in d orbitals or you can say number of incompletely filled, 
number of incompletely filled number of incompletely filled d orbital the color properties of d block elements much more dependent on the various factors the first factor is number of unpaired electrons in d orbitals or number of incompletely filled d orbitals second factor nature of the ligands second factor nature of the ligands second factor nature of the ligands now you consider cu i am writing three examples here cu h2o taken four times copper tetraco complex then this you substitute with a, a amine ligand then cu ns3 taken four times this is again plus 2 and uh, then also take cl minus cu cl4 cu cl4 minus 2 this is a aqua complex amine complex chloro complex now this is actually light blue in color this is light blue this is dark blue in color dark blue but this is actually green in color dark blue and green color what do you understand by this if you are changing the ligand the color is also changing aqua complex light blue and uh, amine complex dark blue and chloro complex green as the ligand you are changing color is also changing therefore color property dependent on nature of the ligand coming to next one geometry the color property is also influenced by geometry consider simply a nickel plus 2 ion nickel plus 2 ion remember nickel plus 2 ion can form three types of complexes it may be a octahedral complex oh i am writing as octahedral complex and it may be a square planar complex square planar complex let me say tetrahedral complex nickel plus 2 d8 only nickel plus 2 d8 electronic configuration right in nickel plus 2 d8 it is forming three complexes three are having three different geometries in all these geometries in all these complexes what is the metal ion present nickel plus 2 what is the configuration d8 only in all these metal ion is same and configuration is same but once their geometry different and these three are definitely exhibiting three different color consider first one for example let me say x color second one definitely y color third one definitely z color so only the difference in the geometry makes they are exhibiting different colors one is x y and z like this the color property dependent on three factors one is number of unpaired electrons d orbitals or incompletely filled d orbitals and nature of the ligands and also geometry these are the factors influencing the color property of d block elements and their compounds next look here there is a relationship between absorbed and transmitted colors there is a relationship between absorbed and transmitted colors let me write a small table absorbed and transmitted absorbed and transmitted colors now consider x color is absorbed y color is transmitted once y color is absorbed definitely is it is transmitting x color only there is relationship between absorbed and transmitted color x is absorbed y is transmitted once y is absorbed x is transmitted consider suppose blue color is absorbed only orange is transmitted if orange is absorbed you can easily say blue is transmitted the pairs of colors either x y you take or blue and orange orange and blue this particular blue and orange the pairs of colors what we call them as complementary colors complementary complementary colors we call this particular the pairs of absorbed and transmitted colors we call them as what a complementary colors now let me show a table entire visible region we take what color is actually absorbed what color is actually transmitted what are the complementary colors among this particular visible region of light visible region of light let me make a table here then you can easily understand what color is absorbed what color is transmitted now let me say here first i'll write vibzr v i b g y o r here i write a uh, uv here i am writing what a uh, ir let me number these particular colors you see 
it is our infrared, red, orange, yellow, yellow green a combined color is there. Then you say green and again blue green and blue this is what indigo and uh, violet. I am remembering for convenience sake to write the observed colors infrared, red, orange, yellow, yellow green, green, blue green, blue, indigo, violet. I made this particular numbering to make the all observed color. It is only simply our convenience how to make this particular observed colors. The same numbering I am following the order you see infrared, red, orange, orange, yellow, yellow green, yellow green, then you take green, yellow green, green, then you can say blue green, blue green and uh, blue, blue, indigo, indigo and you take violet then we let me say uv these are the order of absorbed colors you take absorbed color you take then we have to make the complementary colors for this complementary colors complementary colors for this now i am numbering like this 1 2 3 4 let me see blue green blue indigo and violet blue green blue indigo and uh, violet now see this particular infrared infrared you know this particular infrared is what invisible look at here once invisible is absorbed invisible only transmitted therefore once infrared is absorbed it will be colorless it will be colorless infrared colorless let you take red orange yellow yellow green these particular four numbers let us consider if orange it is blue green is transmitted blue green is transmitted red if next orange it will be what uh, blue is transmitted yellow then it will be indigo indigo is transmitted and yellow green this will be violet this will be violet for this particular green a separate color is there then you can take it is what the uh, pink green is absorbed pink is pink is transmitted once you make this particular half of the table remaining half you can make come on say easily you can make it now blue green it will be red blue green it will be red then blue you can easily say it is what uh, orange and uh, indigo you can say yellow you can say yellow and uh, next uh, violet it is yellow green yellow green then uv you can simply say it is again colorless uv is again invisible once invisible is absorbed invisible is only transmitted so according to this table we can understand that what color is absorbed what color is transmitted in what way these are actually complementary to each other but question never appears if orange is absorbed what is actually transmitted but what actually you are understanding from this particular table is from this particular table is when a color from longer wavelength region is absorbed, longer wavelength region is absorbed, color from shorter wavelength region is transmitted and vice versa and vice versa. Look at here, red is absorbed, red is what here, longer wavelength region, longer wavelength. Once longer wavelength region is absorbed, shorter wavelength region, blue green, what is blue green is transmitted. Longer is absorbed, shorter is transmitted. Suppose shorter is absorbed, longer is transmitted that we are understanding from this particular table. What we can conclude? When a color from shorter wavelength is absorbed, a color from longer wavelength region is transmitted and vice versa. Shorter is absorbed, longer is transmitted. Longer is absorbed, shorter is transmitted. That is the concept we are understanding from this particular table. So, this is complementary colors and uh, it is a table. Let us see how a question appears on this particular color properties. Now, which of the following is which of the following is colored? 
Which of the following is colloid? Consider A, it is what? Uh, CuCl, B, Cu2Cl2, C and CdCl2, D. Let us take uh, CuCl2. This is the question appeared. Then you have to say according to our generalization, wherever no unpaired electron, D0 configuration is there, D10 configuration is there, that particular compound is found to be colorless. Now, we consider CuCl, Cu is actually plus 1, plus 1 means what? D10, therefore it is colorless. Coming to Cu2 Cl2, same oxidation number, this is what again Cu plus 1, still it is what? Uh, D10. And Cd Cl2, you know Cd is also plus 2, still it is what? Uh, D10 configuration, therefore colorless. In the case of Cu Cl2, you can consider Cu plus 2, this is what actually D9. Therefore, CuCl2 only exhibit color as CuCl2 carrying what uh, D9 configuration, one unpaired electron is there. Then the excitation and de-excitation is possible, absorption and emission is possible. Therefore, only CuCl2 is exhibiting color, remaining all are colorless. This is the way questions appear in the examination. One more important point is there in this particular color properties. Now, let me explain what is that important point here. What I generalized actually any configuration D0 configuration, D10 configuration, these are actually colorless, these are actually colorless. Now, we consider D0 or D10 you can take scandium plus 3 and titanium plus 4 take. and uh, D10 configurations you can consider copper plus 1 simply zinc plus 2 take. These are what D0 configuration these are D10 configuration, they are colorless, no doubt. But one very, very important thing is there in the case of KMNO4 rutic, potassium permanganate. Consider one more point uh, K2CR2O7, K2CR2O7. What is the oxidation number of manganese in this well known to you? Manganese is what? Plus 7. What is the oxidation number of chromium well known to you? It is what? Plus 6. What is the electronic configuration of Mn plus 7? D0 configuration. D0 configuration. So, what is the electronic configuration of manganese? 25 means D5 S2. How many electrons are there in the valence and penultimate shell D and S? 7 electron. It is losing all the 7 electrons, it is becoming what equal to 0. Then chromium plus 6, what is the configuration? D5 S1. Losing all the 6 electrons, then it is again D0 configuration. See. KMnO4 and K2Cr2O7, both of these are carrying D0 configurations. What we said, if D0 configuration is there, they should not exhibit in color. But I hope you know well, KMnO4 and K2Cr2O7 exhibiting color. You might have seen in the laboratory, KMnO4 is dark purple in the color, dark purple in color and K2Cr2O7 dark orange in color. Both of these are exhibiting color even though D0 configuration no unpaired electron. This is due to charge transfer phenomenon. It is very, very important in most of the exams, this particular question is frequently appearing. The K104 and K2Cr2O7, even though D0 configuration exhibiting color, this is due to charge transfer phenomenon. It is a very, very important term to remember. Charge transfer phenomenon, charge transfer phenomenon, it is very, very important to remember. KMnO4 and K2Cr2O7, even though D0 configuration exhibit color, this is due to charge transfer phenomenon. Next, uh, let us see the next uh, heading, catalytic properties we will discuss. Catalytic properties. Catalytic properties. catalytic properties. See most of the d-block elements and their compound generally we use as what a catalyst. Why d-block elements only preferred the in industrial catalyst or in other chemical reactions we are using many times the many reactions we are using this particular catalyst only either d-block metals or their compounds. Why we prefer to use these uh, why these are acting as what a best catalyst? It is due to variable oxidation states to take, variable oxidation states or variable valencies. 
variable valencies. Variable oxygen states are variable valencies. It is also due to presence of unpaid electrons in d orbitals, unpaid electrons in d orbitals or incompletely filled d orbital. Variable oxygen states are variable valencies or it is due to unpaid electrons and uh, incompletely filled uh, d orbitals. Then you can take in the finely divided state, in the finely powdered state, these are having greater atomic surfaces. In the finely powdered state, these are having greater atomic surfaces, easily adsorb the reactants. Now, we consider A and B plus catalyst, let me say D block, D block. A and B reactants in presence of catalyst D block element and uh, because of greater atomic surfaces, this is actually easily adsorbing this particular reactant and facilitate the reaction to take place facilitate the reaction to take place. What you are getting? A B catalyst, this is unstable intermediate you are getting, unstable intermediate, unstable intermediate you are getting, ultimately it is decomposing, you are getting what C product again you are getting catalyst. Due to this particular reasons, what reasons? Variable oxygen states, variable valencies, unpaid electrons, incompletely filled d orbitals, finely powdered state, they are having greater atomic surfaces, adsorb the reactants and form a unstable intermediate and facilitate the reaction to take place. Because of these reasons, most of the d block elements and their compounds act as best catalysts, best catalysts. Just few catalysts and their, and their industrial importance, I will make a table so that you can remember these catalysts are also very, very important. In most of the entrance exams, these are frequently appearing, very few I mention on the board now. Catalyst and importance of the catalyst, catalyst and uh, its uh, importance, catalyst and its uh, importance. Let me take the first one, Ziegler Nutta catalyst, Ziegler Nutta. Ziegler Nutta catalyst, it is very, very important, it is very, very important. It is actually appearing in uh, most of the entrance exams. Now, it is, it is actually a mixture of titanium tetrachloride plus aluminum alkyls, titanium tetrachloride and uh, aluminum alkyls. It is a mixture of titanium tetrachloride and aluminum alkyl. What is actually importance of this particular catalyst? It is actually used for low temperature polymerization of polymerization of ethylene to polythene ethylene to polythene low temperature polymerization of ethylene to polythene it's a very important catalyst you might be knowing this particular v2o5 v2o5 it is commercial manufacture of what uh, sulfuric acid sulfuric acid by contact process, sulfuric acid by contact process, this is the particular catalyst is used. So, Ziegler Nutta catalyst V2O5, MnO2, MnO2 is the catalyst used for the decomposition of KClO3, decomposition of, decomposition of KClO3 for the preparation of oxygen, for the preparation of oxygen. Now, you consider FeCl3, FeCl3 used for this manufacture of CCl4 from CS2 and Cl2, CS2 and Cl2. These are some important catalysts and their commercial importance. This is about catalytic properties of these elements. Next, we see the complex formation and formation of interstitial compounds. Complex formation, complex formation. Most of the d block elements highly capable of forming complex compounds. Why these are highly capable of forming complex compounds? It is again variable valencies, variable valencies or you can take variable oxidation states, 
variable valencies or variable oxygen states, presence of incompletely filled d orbitals, presence of incompletely filled d orbitals or unpaid electrons in d orbitals. Next, smaller size of their cations, greater charge density, smaller size of their cations and greater charge density. Consider this particular ferric ion, consider ferric ion Fe plus 3. Fe plus 3 is very small in size, possess greater positive charge density, positive charge density. It can easily show a electrostatic force on the ligand, electrostatic force on the ligand easily. Therefore, variable valencies, variable oxygen states, unpaired electrons in d orbitals, incompletely filled d orbitals, smaller size of their cations and greater charge densities. These are the reasons for why this particular d block elements easily form complex compound. You might be knowing complex compounds, let me lay write uh, 1 or 2 K4 Fe C and taken 6, potassium ferrocyanide we call. And let us take uh, K3 Fe C and taken 6, uh, what to call potassium ferricyanide. It is ferricyanide iron plus 3, ferrocyanide iron plus 2. Like this, most of the d block elements highly capable of forming complex compound due to these reasons. Next, uh, let me discuss the interstitial compounds or alloys. Interstitial compounds or alloys. Interstitial compounds or alloys. What are these interstitial compounds or alloys? You take a transient metallic lattice transient metallic lattice. In any lattice you take or solid you take, the atoms are tightly packed like this, tightly packed like this. Yes, you are clearly observing on the board, whatever the way they are tightly packed, you are clearly observing there is interatomic spaces, interatomic spaces. These interatomic spaces, we call them as interstitious, interstitious, interatomic spaces. These interatomic spaces, the interatomic spaces occupied by smaller atoms like it may be hydrogen, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. The interatomic spaces or interstitious are occupied by smaller atoms like hydrogen, boron, carbon, nitrogen producing special type of compound, special type of compounds known as interstitial compounds or alloys. Now, the transient metallic hydrides, borides, carbides, nitrides, oxides. The transient metallic hydrides, borides, carbides, nitrides, oxides all are coming under interstitial compounds. Interstitial compounds. Next, why d block elements are highly capable of forming these interstitial compounds? Due to more or less same reasons, presence of or uh, variable valencies, presence of variable valencies, variable valencies or variable oxidation states, variable valencies, variable oxygen states and again due to incompletely filled d orbitals, incompletely filled d orbitals and uh, unpaid electrons and uh, unpaid electrons. These are the reasons for this particular d block elements are easily forming this interstitial compound, variable valencies, variable oxygen states, unpaid electrons, incompletely filled d orbitals. Next, this particular interstitial compounds exhibiting some special properties. What are the properties exhibited by these interstitial compounds? Interstitial compounds. Now, properties of interstitial compound. First one, their chemical properties, their chemical properties more or less identical to chemical properties of parent metal, parent metal, chemical properties of parent metal. So, chemical properties of these compounds are more or less identical to parent metal. Next, physical properties we talk about, physical properties they are differing from parent metal. Physically they are actually different, but chemical properties are more or less identical to this particular parent metal. Next, look at here, these are actually very hard substances, very hard 
their melting points are very high very hard their melting points are very high their melting points are even more than parent metal even more than parent metals next these are remember non stoichiometric compounds these are non stoichiometric these are non stoichiometric they are not following any valency rules they are non stoichiometric not following any valency rules valency rules next these are non stoichiometric and uh, not following any valency rules the best examples and uh, these are actually good electrical conductors these are also acting as what good electrical conductor under these best examples you can take uh, cast iron cast iron and steels almost all the steels and cast iron you can take the examples under interstitial compounds or alloys interstitial compounds or alloys next we we'll discuss the electrode potentials electrode potentials look here copper and mercury are having copper and mercury are having positive reduction potentials positive reduction potentials positive reduction potential any element which is having greater reduction potential that is positive reduction potential they cannot easily liberate hydrogen from dilute acids dilute acid this particular copper and mercury or uh, cannot liberate easily hydrogen from dilute acids like dilute hcl or any other dilute acid these cannot easily act as what a uh, reducing it excluding this particular two elements remaining most of the d block elements having negative reduction potentials negative reduction potentials once negative reduction potential is there lower reduction potentials these will be above hydrogen in the electrochemical series once negative reduction potential is there then these are found to be above the hydrogen in the electrochemical series the element which are having negative reduction potentials they are above hydrogen in the electro electrochemical series they can easily liberate hydrogen gas from dilute acid this particular remaining all the elements easily liberate hydrogen gas from dilute acids now we consider chromium manganese yes chromium manganese iron cobalt nickel chromium manganese iron cobalt nickel we consider these are having what uh, negative reduction potential negative reduction potential what i said the metal or element which is having negative reduction potential values they how to liberate hydrogen gas easily from the dilute acid even though these are having negative reduction potential they are not easily liberating hydrogen gas they are not easily liberating hydrogen gas this is due to formation of protective oxide layer on the surface of these metals what i said negative reduction potential is there they how to liberate hydrogen gas easily but they are not easily liberating hydrogen as we are expecting this is due to what factor these are easily forming a protective oxide layer on the surface chromium easily generating a oxide layer cr2o3 mn2o3 fe2o3 co2o3 ni2o3 because of this particular reason even though they are having negative reduction potential values they are not easily liberating hydrogen gas from dilute acids dilute acids next we see the next we see the shapes of d orbitals and metallic lattices of d block elements metallic lattices metallic lattices see this metallic lattices generally any solid or a metal possessing generally three metallic lattices either it may be scp metallic lattice well known to you bcc metallic lattice or it may be fcc metallic lattice hcp means hexagonal cross packing bcc body centered cubic lattice and fcc face centered cubic lattice generally any solid or the metal possessing either of the three metallic lattices questions appearing on this metallic lattices what is the metallic lattice possessed by zirconium what is the metallic lattice possessed by zinc such questions are appearing in the different entrance exam therefore it is better to remember the metallic lattice of 
this particular d block element yes it is difficult to remember all the 30 elements and the metallic lattices by let us say all the 3d 4d 5d we classify this particular elements and try to remember in easy way this particular metallic lattices i am writing now 3d 4d 5d three series i will classify in easy way this particular metallic lattices now you consider 3d series to take scandium titanium vanadium chromium manganese iron cobalt nickel copper and zinc 3d series come to 4d series yttrium zirconium niobium molybdenum technetium ruthenium rhodium palladium silver cadmium 4d series to take next you know this 5d series take lanthanum hafnium tantalum tungsten rhenium osmium iridium platinum au hg now these are 3d 4d 5d elements now the first two series the first two vertical columns are having a metallic lattice of hcp metallic lattice of hcp first two vertical columns hcp second two vertical columns second two vertical columns having a metallic lattice of bcc metallic lattice of bcc third two metallic again third two vertical columns third two vertical columns having a metallic lattice of metallic lattice of again hcp but one thing you have to remember this manganese metallic lattice is not clearly known not clearly known next uh, iron is not having in this hcp but is exception it is having a bcc metallic lattice bcc metallic lattice next uh, coming to remaining three vertical columns remaining three vertical columns having ccp or fcc both are one and same ccp or fcc in this all nine elements except this particular this particular cobalt is having hcp remaining all are having fcc or ccp last uh, zinc is having a metallic lattice of hcp cadmium is having a metallic lattice of again hcp these are the metallic lattices and mercury is liquid therefore it is not having a particular metallic lattice so remembering all the 30 elements and their metallic lattice is little difficult therefore i made it little easy to remember most of the d block elements are having scp metallic lattice look the board next easy to remember first two vertical columns scp second two bcc third two hcp but one or two exceptions and next three vertical columns all are having ccp or fcc and the cobalt is scp zinc hcp and cadmium hcp like this in easy way you can remember the metallic lattices of this particular element how the question appear which of the following element is having hcp metallic lattice such questions are appearing so that if you could able to remember in this way easily can answer in the entrance exam any type of question appearing on this metallic lattices next we see shapes of d orbitals well known to you it is well covered in your first year and uh, year and day but still in a detailed discussion we require the shapes of uh, d orbitals now in the d subshell there is five d orbitals the d subshell there is five d orbitals the d subshell there is five d orbitals well known to you this is what dxy dxz and uh, dyz can take d x square minus y square and uh, d z square so d x y d x z y z and uh, d x square minus y square and uh, d z square out of this particular 5d orbitals first three d x y x z y z we classify this particular as what uh, t to the set of orbital t to the set of orbital remaining two we call it as what uh, e z set of orbital e z set of orbital can you say what is the difference between t to z and e z two sets of orbital remember in the case of t to z set of orbitals the orbitals are the lobes are oriented in between the axis the lobes are oriented in between the axis these are known as what non axial orbitals 
non axial orbitals these the lobes are actually oriented along the axis these are generally known as what uh, axial orbital these are axial orbitals these are non axial orbital let us see the shapes of this particular d orbital one should talk about dxy this is actually oriented between x and y this is actually oriented in between x and y plus plus and minus minus this what to say dxy orbital and uh, dxz you take a uh, it is oriented in between x and z oriented in between x and uh, z uh, this is plus plus and again minus minus this can take a uh, xz then yz oriented in between y and uh, z uh, this is what uh, yz orbital which is oriented in between y and z so let us say this y and z you are clearly observing these are what i said non axial this particular orbitals are oriented in between the axis these are what uh, non axial these are oriented along the axis consider d x square minus y square oriented along x axis and uh, y axis it oriented along x and uh, y this is considered what uh, d x square minus uh, y square let me say wave functions also i am putting plus plus and uh, minus this is x square minus y square next uh, can take a uh, d z square orbital this is what x z uh, this is oriented along only z axis this is d z square orbital this is plus plus and uh, minus minus this is d z square orbital now what you are looking these are oriented along the axis axial orbital oriented in between the axis non axial orbital moreover i put plus plus and minus minus imagine these are not the charges these particular signs whatever i put these are only wave functions wave functions next you are clearly observing in these orbitals the opposite lobes are carrying identical wave functions identical wave function we can easily cut these particular orbitals into two equal halves this particular carrying opposite lobe same wave function we can cut into equal halves therefore they are symmetric therefore this particular all the d orbitals we can call them as what zeroed uh, zeroed means what do you understand zeroed means symmetric zeroed means symmetric orbitals symmetric next all the d orbitals this particular dz square orbital is dumbbell in shape dumbbell in shape and also its shape also we can call it as baby mather baby mather in shape baby mather in shape D dumbbell in shape or baby mather remaining all the orbitals we are clearly looking these are what double dumbbell in shape among the d orbitals dz square orbital is dumbbell in shape remaining all are actually double dumbbell in shape all the d orbitals opposite lobes are carrying identical wave functions they are symmetric therefore they are known as what a zeroed orbital these are all zeroed orbital this is about this particular d orbital and one more point also we can say this particular dz square orbital this particular dz square orbital is a combination of dz square orbital is a combination of dx square minus dx square minus z square and it is actually dy square minus z square it is a combination of dx square minus z square and dy square minus z square this particular dz square the combination of both of these particular orbitals this is about shapes of uh, d orbitals